This is your Day X World War III update. This is a very important emergency update. Something is not right with this global naval exercise currently being conducted by the Russians. Some of you might be familiar with the Oceans 2024 exercise. This is Russia's largest ever naval exercise since the Soviet era, since 40 years ago during the Cold War. What's unique about this exercise is that it's not isolated to any given region of Russia's borders. In fact, it spans <clears throat> multiple different oceans and seas, from the Pacific Ocean to the Caspian Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, the Baltic, the Arctic, and I just highlighted Russia, Russia's mainland because, of course, Russia has been in a heightened state of readiness for the last two and a half years. This is essentially Russia's way of moving to a higher DEFCON level, I'm not sure what it's referred to there, a higher state of combat readiness to prepare for a nuclear war. Make no mistake about it, this is not a large-scale naval exercise. This is a nuclear war exercise. Under what other scenario would you have to have this type of coordination amongst all of your naval forces, asides a full-blown war with NATO? This is exactly what Russia is doing right now. They're saying these exercises are going to end on the 16th. Interestingly, this is essentially their entire Navy. Okay, their entire Navy, 400 vessels, we're talking about nuclear submarines, all of their warships that have nuclear-tipped caliber missiles on them, all of their assets are currently live and wired until September 16th. Do they actually expect that something is gonna go down. Is this an exercise at all? Remember my old saying, there are no military exercises, only World War III disguises. When World War III really starts, I don't mean, uh, you know, how it ostensibly started 20 years ago, 30, 40 years ago. Some, for some people, technically we've been in a state of war, a low intensity conflict since World War II, and it's about to finally go kinetic in a nuclear sense, but, when nuclear war starts, it will be preceded by an exercise because that's the only way you can conceal your maneuver at this point in time is via exercise. So anytime one side does an exercise, the other side has to presume that it might possibly be real world. And the reason why is as follows. Right now, you have Anthony Blinken and his counterpart from the UK, Lamy, I think his name is, they just went to Ukraine and they greenlit, and I don't understand why they are so amused and jovial in this picture, because they've effectively put the final chess piece on the table, which is going to enable Ukraine to conduct deep strikes using heavy ordnance cruise missiles into Russia proper. If this precedent is set, and if Vladimir Putin and the Russian MOD are okay with having cruise missiles hit Moscow. We just seen Moscow hit by a drone, completely unprecedented since this war began. Got virtually no coverage. Much like World War III got barely any coverage in that grandstanding spectacle of an American debate last night, where we didn't talk about the prospect of thermonuclear Armageddon until like 75 minutes into the damn debate. That tells you that people are asleep when it comes to this stuff. Yes, Trump is using World War III as a uh, potential political talking point in order to get elected. But uh, be under no illusions about what is going to happen, whether either of those candidates win. It is going to be war. I'm not going to give you my long-winded Thucydides trap hypothesis as it pertains to all of this stuff, but understand that NATO is getting prepared to do a decapitation strike on the Russians. They've been collecting data on Russian missile defense via these drone raids, and now they're about to up the ante even more and collect even more data on Russian missile defense by using some of their bigger guns. These weapon systems have a range, the longer range variants, of up to, I believe it's 700 kilometers, well within, Moscow is well within range. I disregard Moscow though, 
Because it's not really, yes, that would be a, a good Pyrrhic victory uh, for the Ukrainians, although in this respect, I'm sure that the United States would not like that. Because right now, Zelensky is being tasked. He has a homework assignment that was given to him by Joe Biden, if you can believe that. Uh, yeah, I mean, Joe Biden, is, it, listen, Joe Biden's not doing anything right now. This is what Joe Biden's doing. Uh, Joe Biden's getting trolled by people in, what was this, Pennsylvania or something? I don't know. But anyways, uh, this is not Photoshop, guys. They actually got him to put on a Trump hat in jest, but still silly. This is Ad Anthony Blinken's response to that right here. This is one of the guys who's actually running the show, okay? So they're getting ready to provoke the Russians into nuclear Armageddon. If Russia permits Ukraine to start targeting, which is effectively NATO, to start targeting deep inside Russia, then there really is no other red line after that. What other red line is there? after that, especially if they're going to be targeting things that are integral to Russia's strategic nuclear triad. Because the nuclear triad is not just comprised of Russian nuclear weapons. It's the grid that those nuclear weapons are hardwired to, and all of the uh, logistics that are associated with it, and all of the other uh, grid-based infrastructure that if compromised would put Russia's capacity to respond to nuclear warfare, that it would diminish it. So Russia has to presume that when Ukraine says that they're going to be targeting air bases, that's a strategic target. Factories, that's a strategic target. Logistics, strategic target. Ships, definitely strategic target because they have nuclear weapons on them. Air defense, or potentially could have air uh, on them. Air defense, absolutely strategic. Without a doubt, strategic. Uh, what else do we got? Ammunition depots, of course. Maybe not strategic in the nuclear sense, but still gunning for the strategic defeat of Russia. Guys, this is so fucking serious right now. And nobody's talking about it. I mean, okay. Zelensky. He comes out and says, <laughs> with reference to Schultz's peace plan, if you guys are in the know about this stuff, maybe not everybody who watches the channel is, but Olaf Scholz the other day said, yeah, we're talking about peace and the, this war must end peacefully. I've been saying since the beginning of this conflict, since Boris Johnson went on his misadventure to Kiev two years ago, where he coaxed Ukraine into continuing to fight the Russians and tore up the existing peace agreement. You see, every time Ukraine starts to wane, in its enthusiasm for this conflict, NATO comes with a bit more drugs. It's just like a drug dealer. When you sense that your addict is going to want to get, get off the drugs and jump on the wagon, you throw them a free bag. And that keeps them addicted. Here's what Zelensky had to say about that today. He said that as to Scholz's peace plan, we don't know anything about it. And there can be no plans without Ukraine, without us. Every single time, every single time. Name one time when they said throughout this conflict that they were going to engage in peace talks and they were ready for peace talks that wasn't just a few days or a few weeks later followed by a massive escalation. When this war started, you had, I think the estimate was 700,000 Ukrainian soldiers, okay, and these were well-trained, well-equipped soldiers. At that time, we were only providing them with javelins. As their manpower began to diminish as a result of this attritional war that's currently underway, they needed more advanced technology to compensate for that deficiency in manpower. Now, think about how far we've come. We're already past F-16s. They're already there. They're not there in full force, but they will be. We don't even know where they are, where they're flying from. We don't know if they're flying over the borders. We don't know if that's the reason why Russia ain't sending drones so close to Poland and Romania and all of the Baltic states, we don't know what's truly going on with the F-16s, but we know they're already there. And we know that the Dutch have already permitted Ukraine to use its F-16s inside Russia proper. We know that the UK has now effectively greenlit strikes deep into Moscow. The Russians have already known, this is being broadcast on all Russian media right now, that the, that the decision has already been made in private. Understand what that means that we, NATO, are going to effectively start targeting Russia's 
nuclear triad because everything revolves around that. The strategic defeat of Russia doesn't just mean, I don't mean that they're going to start dropping nukes on Russia's nuclear weapons depots. They're not going to do that. If they do that, then, you know, this is going to catalyze much faster. What they're going to do is they're going to start surgically trying to, to take out Russia's conventional forces. But at the same time, you can't help but cut some of their veins of unconventional forces. And so if Russia permits this final step of NATO weapons being used deep inside Russia, then it's game over. Okay, and the Russians are going to have to make a move. And this is why they're panicking. This is why they're broadcasting the largest ever exercise since the Soviet era. And here's what Putin had to say. If you think that this is just, you know, me speculating and stuff, it absolutely is not. Remember Steadfast Defender with NATO earlier in the year that was along the eastern flank, essentially all the way up the eastern flank. Well, the Russians have now done their equivalent, but it's a global, okay? So typically these things are isolated to certain regions of the map. This is a global naval exercise. Again, this could just be a total smokescreen and there's no exercises happening at all other than that they're on a higher state of readiness. We really don't know. The idea that the Russians would have all of the material needed to conduct such a large scale exercise and do live fire drills in all of these theaters of conflict. Uh, at this point in time, you know, maybe there's some strategic benefit to telegraphing to that show of strength, show strength when you're weak type thing. But uh, I don't know, this looks like just an excuse to, and I think that they're exaggerating the numbers a little bit, 400 warships, as far as I know, exceeds the actual amount of warships Russia actually has, unless they're talking about these other uh, support vessels and things of that nature. But here's what Putin had to say. Under the pretext of countering the allegedly existing Russian threat and containing the People's Republic of China, the United States and its satellites are building up their military presence near Russia's western borders. I repeat, NATO has been effectively trying to fleece out and trying to flush out what Russia's defensive network looks like. With these drone strikes, they're creating a three-dimensional version of Russian airspace so that when the time comes to do that decapitation strike, they can do it as effectively as possible. This is why they're positioning all of their stealth fighter jets in bunkers proximate to the border near Russia along the entirety of NATO's so-called eastern flank. That's NATO's only flank. I, I'll never understand why they call it the Eastern flank. It's so stupid. I mean, who are they going to be invaded by? Tunisia, Morocco, Egypt, Libya? Okay, let's not have a political conversation about that. But you know what I mean? There's only one flank and it's called Russia. So the idea that they have a flank at all is just is silly. It's like the Israeli uh, calling themselves a defense force. Okay, so we have... Putin also saying we will continue to strengthen our Navy, including its strategic and nuclear component. We will systematically and comprehensively develop all types and branches of the armed forces, increasing their strike capabilities, improving their training and shipping crews. Notice the language that he's using. He explicitly states that this relates to strategic and nuclear component. The Russians are preparing to fight a nuclear war with NATO in the biggest exercise since the Cold War and not a blip about it in the bullshit debates. Not a blip about it in the bullshit debates. And these guys look like kids in a candy store. I mean, this guy looks like he's been smoking something, smoking some of that normalcy Norman. I don't know, I mean, I know he likes to get up there and rock the mic with his guitar and stuff, but I never knew he was that into that sort of thing. I mean, you must have to, though, when you, when you have to deal with, uh, with this guy here, right? Like, when you got to deal with, with this, I mean, that's probably the only way you, you sleep at night. Smoke a little something, something. Okay, so here, here let, let's get into the weeds here. I talked about this nonsense, how essentially Zelensky denies that there was ever a peace plan. There ain't no, going to be no peace plan. If anything, they're going to try to wrap this up before the election. They're going to do whatever they can to provoke the shit out of the Russians before the election. And honestly, at this point, if Russia does not respond this time, 
if they allow NATO to cross this red line, that's it. Because they're effectively saying, you can do whatever you want, and we ain't going to do nada. Because once you let one of those missiles in, you've effectively let a whole bunch in. And understand that the Russian, the Russian country is so huge. Right now, they can, they're still doing good. Their air defense is working for the most part. But Ukraine is still able to, to strike targets using their attackums inside this small region. You open that up. 500 kilometer diameter from the border 500 kilometer radius i should say from the border that is going to be i'm just looking for my maps here to give some perspective uh, that is going to be impossible to defend against all those things much like these drone strikes are impossible to defend against because russia is just too huge okay here's some of the language being used this is the uh, Russian ambassador in the U.S. Note the language that he's using here. I've never seen them be so forthright in their nuclear rhetoric. The U.S. goal of inflicting strategic defeat, and remember, this is not maniacal, incorrigible Medvedev, the guy who uh, now the Ukrainian NAFO crowd is saying has cirrhosis of the liver because he's been drinking too much. This is not him. This guy is, you know, a pretty straight shooter as far as diplomacy goes. U.S. goal of inflicting strategic defeat of Russia, unrealistic. The U.S. government is ready to sacrifice the well-being of the citizens by delivering weapons and ammunition worth billions of dollars to the Kiev regime. That is a direct threat to the United States. That if you enable Ukraine to target deep into our cities, you're going to get nukes. And that's the end of it. Here's what Putin has to say today. Russia must be ready to repel military aggression from any direction. The Russian leader wished the participants of the exercise success in accomplishing the assigned tasks. What the hell does that even mean? Meanwhile, you have Anthony Blinken. Get a load of this. I don't, I don't know if I have the exact quote. I'm sure I do have it somewhere around here. Okay. This is what he had to say with respect to the Russian relationship with Iran, with respect to the Russians getting ballistic missiles. Here's what he had to say. In return for the new missiles, Russia will provide Iran with technology, and this is a direct quote, including on nuclear issues, as well as some space information. Now, this is just something he said in passing. The reporters didn't press him on this. What does he mean? by nuclear issues is this just an extension of the the jcpoa agreement of which the russians have uh, taken a lead role in facilitating which of course enables the ukraine the iranians i don't always mix up ukrainians and iranians it's the anians that uh, unite us all but uh, essentially uh, they've been uh, assisting the the iranians with their nuclear program, their peaceful nuclear program, but the implication that he's saying here, listen to this. This is Anthony Blinken essentially saying or implying that Russia is helping out the Iranians get nuclear weapons. I mean, did everybody miss this in the alternative media news? I mean, that is a huge statement, including on nuclear issues, as well as some space-based information. He would not say that unless it pertained to nuclear weapons. Could it be that the Russians, could it be that the rumors are true? There are rumors circulating and these are just rumors. Plain and simple, just rumors. You know all those military planes that have been going into Iran? Well, they've been dropping stuff off and I'm presuming now that they've also been picking stuff up. Some people are suspecting that the Russians are sending Iskander missiles with nuclear tips down to Iran. Now, why would, why would Iran need Iskander missiles? They have their own uh, missiles that can do the same thing if, if it was just conventional missiles. Now, if it's true, if it's true that Iskander missiles are entering into Iran, then we must presume that they have nuclear missiles on them. That they have nuclear warheads on them, I should say. <sighs> And that is, now you're seeing more sanctions on Iran Air. They can no longer travel to Europe 
But it also shows you uh, the weakness of the United States empire right now in that all they could really do about the situation was put in sanctions on the Iranians. It really makes you wonder, it almost seems inevitable that Iran is going to be able to get nuclear weapons if they don't already have them. What an insane situation that is unfolding here. So the Ukrainians, <laughs> the Ukrainians have now threatened Iran. They said that if you send Russia ballistic missiles that are going to bomb our cities, we're going to bomb you. Now, Ukraine must realize there's a reason why Israel has F-35s, nuclear weapons, and all the bells and whistles that the United States can muster, and they don't. They ain't Israel. If Iran wants to strike Ukraine, then shit's going to get real, real fast. I mean, that's going to bring everything together for World War III when you think about it. Because in Israel will have more modus operandi and casus belli to come to the aid of uh, Ukraine against Iran. There'll be more, Iran will become more of a global pariah. And, uh, and then it'll just all come together. And, and like I've said for the longest time, as long as this war goes on with Ukraine and Russia, you are going to see both sides digging in their heels more and more. And we're going to see the, the, uh, the bipolar or multipolar world continue to become increasingly more polarized. This is crazy, man. When you really, you know, I, I don't always articulate what I'm seeing in the best way, but I, I wish sometimes that people would just, I'd be able to take my brain and hand it to you and really communicate the seriousness of the situation because I can't possibly express everything I have to say in a way that is going to be short to the point and engaging. This is Sergei Kraganov, the author of what I call the Kraganov Doctrine. He is the escalate to de-escalate nuclear guy, okay? And he is basically saying, it's not me. It looks like, is that me? I'm trying to make my head the same size as his. No, can't do it. He is basically saying that the time has come. Okay, it's, it's do or die. Enemies must be sure Russia is ready to use nuclear weapons. The existing doctrine is outdated and does not serve as a deterrent. This guy is getting a lot more airtime. It used to be that these stories were, you know, the very small citations in these, these off-the-beaten-path op-eds, but now this is front-page Russian news. Front-page Russian news. You have them talking about what they're going to do in order to deter and stop a nuclear war. It's that close, guys. It's that close. And this is on every single mainstream media inside Russia right now. They're all talking about it. Even Vladimir Putin, in his very usual statesmanlike language where he uses uh, various euphemisms to try to disguise the seriousness of the situation. But just remember, there are no military exercises, only World War III disguises. When World War III starts, it's going to start as an exercise. I'm, still, I'm just in disbelief. I'm in total disbelief. In addition to allowing the... Ukrainians to target deep inside Russia. They're going to get another $700 million for whatever they decide to spend it on, I guess. I don't know what kind of auditing is going on in that country right now. I doubt there's much. They're also going to be getting $3 billion per year from the UK. $3 billion per year. And it's already been confirmed by the Telegraph which is a respected news agency inside UK that the UK defense minister has approved storm shadow strikes into Russia. Zelensky is going to meet Biden in a couple days to seal the deal. Michael McCall, House Foreign Affairs chairman, has confirmed that this in fact is going to be the course of events that unfolds. Now, unfortunately for Ukraine, the misadventure in Kursk may be starting to wind down a little bit, but we just never know. The Russians have gone on the counteroffensive. They have 50 to 60,000 troops in the region 
and they're starting push to push back what we presume is between 10 and 20,000 Ukrainian troops who are now quite dug in. Recall a couple days ago, Aladinov, one of the commanders overseeing operations in this region, had predicted that the Ukrainians were going to be the ones who went on the defensive and, or sorry, went on the offensive and made a run for the nuclear power plant once again. Well, here the clock is ticking because now you have a situation in which they've just been given the green light to do deep strikes into Russian territory and potentially leverage their newfound capabilities to target these more strategic facilities that are within this region. We're talking, of course, about a nuclear provocation. Attacking the nuclear power plant is potentially the only thing they stand to gain out of this situation. I doubt, I doubt that they're going to be able to fight off 50,000 Russians. It's just an untenable situation. Unless there's more Ukrainian troops there or they're planning on doing something else somewhere else. Uh, it's looking like it, the party's pretty much almost over at this point in time. So the question is, what are they going to do before the election? They already are running low on attackums, but there are some longer range variants that they perhaps haven't used yet because, well, they haven't been really, there hasn't been a reason to use them because why use your long range stuff if you can use your short range stuff? So there may well be there may well be a, a, a glut of long-range weaponry waiting to be used. And it could just be that that's why the West is using it because they don't have any more of the, or enough of the short-range variants to provide them anymore. Dmitry Peskov has also said, the decision to strike deep into Russian territory with Atakum's missiles has already been made and now they're trying to formalize it. Are they going to let this go? Are the Russians actually that stupid to let this go? I don't think they are. I think they're doing their darndest to try to prevent a nuclear war. This is near Russia, the Russian president's dacha in, I don't know what the actual lake is called. Let's see if we can find it here. This is at a lake right near St. Petersburg, big lake, Lake Ladoga. Okay, this lake right here. I don't know if that's, I'm assuming that that's saline. I, it doesn't look like it could be, possibly be fresh water. It might be. Um, that's neither here nor there, but there's a couple warships there. Let me see if I can pull this up here. Okay, so we got a couple warships. This is right next to Finland, okay? So they have two corvettes there, and uh, corvets, corvettes, I don't know how you say that. And these have caliber missiles on them with a 2,500, is it miles or kilometer range? These can have nuclear weapons on them. This is Putin's dacha right here. One of Putin's numerous dachas. I don't know why you'd have a dacha so close to Finland. Maybe it's nice up there. Regardless, uh, this is not here to protect Putin's dacha. These things are here because Finland has F-35s and is currently engaged in a nuclear exercise with the United States. They are an integral piece of the decapitation strike puzzle. These warships are here to annihilate Finland when the shit hits the fan. That's what they're there for. Make no mistake about it. It's from September 8th, 2024. Lake Ladoga. Russia will be forced to use bigger weapons, according to the Duma, Russian Duma chairperson. Russia will be forced to use more powerful and destructive weapons to protect its people, according to Volodin. This was the Duma's chairman's reaction to Zelensky's request by Western countries for permission to use long-range weapons on Russian territory. If the Russians still think that they can contain this, I mean, you got Sergei Shoigu talking about how, well, if the Ukrainians just leave Kursk, then we're going to negotiate. <laughs> And then it worked, right? They, they've been able to move the goalpost. The literal definition of moving the goalpost, Ukraine just did it. Which would be, in a sense, a success. And, but the fact that he's saying that and not saying that we're just going to push him out anyways 
tells you that maybe they're not that confident in pushing them out as you might think. But he's saying that they cannot have any negotiations till the Ukrainians leave Kursk, which is giving people a, a false sense of hope, I do believe. But this is how the Russians tend to play ball. They tend to always leave the door open, or seemingly, at least in, in word only, leave the door open for diplomacy. If you think that Donald Trump is going to change anything about this, my friends, again, Lindsey Graham, his best buddy, the most pro-war guy, is best buddies, maybe not best buddies, but one of the, the, the biggest proponents of Donald Trump's of Donald Trump's campaign, who of course made an integral part of that campaign be his anti-war stance, which is just completely stupid. If anybody believes that, I mean, just think about it. The biggest war hawk in Washington, the biggest, bar none. There's no bigger war hawk in Washington that wants to go to nuclear war with the Russians and the Iranians simultaneously, okay? He is endorsing Donald Trump for some reason. What does he know? This is a guy who was one of the chief authors of the 2014 Maidan coup. So, I believe what you want. There was a drone strike in Russia all the way the hell up here in uh, Murmansk, I believe it's called. Is what it's called? Let's see here. If we can go up to Murmansk. It's way the hell up here. Yes, Murmansk. The Russians, some Russian pundits are claiming, and bloggers are claiming that this drone came from Finland and that there's no possible way that Ukraine could have flown a drone all the way up to here. Let's see what would the distance be. I don't have my distance calculator. This is seven, this is uh, 1,000, so yeah, that's, well over a, th no, that's got to be like 1,500 kilometers or something. So from Ukraine all the way up to Romansk, that's an incredible distance. The drone strikes continue. The probing of Russia's missile defense continues. Yep. Three UAVs were brought down by Russian air defense in Murmansk. I'm not even going to talk about Erdogan in Turkey because that guy is just silly. Now he's saying that, uh, you know, he was one of these fence sitters for the longest time, even though he's got NATO nuclear weapons in his country, Russia still pretends like he's their friend. He's basically saying now that uh, this war only ends with Crimea returning to Ukraine, which is just, you know, the Russians will, will never, the, will, the world will be extinct. Uh, before that actually happens. Okay, we'll all be dead before that happens. Everybody knows that. Everybody in, in a position of authority knows that. I find this interesting. I'm not sure if many people realize this, but this is the total cost of uh, mineral reserves throughout Ukraine. Unmined reserves. Okay, so you can see where the majority of the money is. When Lindsey Graham talks about all of the trillions and billions and billions. Should have a drinking game last night with Donald Trump every time he says billions. In the next debate, we're gonna have a, a drinking game. Donald Trump will do a live feed, billions and billions. Anytime he says billions, we take a drink. Anyways, uh, trillions and trillions of dollars in the region that Russia mostly controls. Most of the resource wealth in Ukraine is in the East. We're talking about 3.5 trillion in the Dnipropetrovsk, 3.8 trillion in Donetsk, 3.2 trillion in Luhansk, 600 billion in Zaporozhia, 685 billion in Kharkov. And then when you look over here, I mean, with the exception of Poltava, 790 billion, it recedes in terms of the, the value. Of course, they have a lot of agricultural renewable land there, which I'm not sure they're factoring all that in. In the long run, that may pay off even more because Ukraine, of course, has very deep topsoil, the best topsoil on the planet, I'm told, and some of the most untapped topsoil on the planet. Gold continues to hold. It continues to trade in this, this range of like, 
how much you'd say like between 25, 20 and 25, 50. It, it's pretty range bound. Gold is holding despite the oil crash. And I think the oil crash is something to do with the fact that global lockdowns in a martial law World War III format may well be on the horizon and less to do with uh, economic slowdown. Even though, I mean, let's take a look at the data. <laughs> we can't be kidding ourselves here. Unrealized gains, losses on investment securities in the billions and billions of dollars for U.S. banks are at an all-time high. That's absolutely insane. We're talking about 600 $500 billion in just the most recent quarter of 2024. Absolutely crazy. These are monthly exports to Russia by country. Here we see the polarization visualized once again. Look at these Chinese exports to Russia skyrocket post-2022. Skyrocket, okay? China and the United States are most definitely going to war. There's no doubt about it. Maria Zakharova talked about an analogy that I've used a lot. I believe she's a foreign minister. I'm not sure of her exact title. But uh, anyways, she's talking about, I'll, I'll read you her quote. She's saying, here's the Titanic, a powerful, very expensive, well-hyped ship. Okay, with people on board who have reached significant heights in their careers. Sailing somewhere in the Atlantic. And on board this very Titanic... There is a match between two famous fighters. I don't know, boxers, kickboxers, or say jujitsu fighters. And so the match ends and people are sitting around asking, hey, who do you think won? But let's remember that this is all happening on the Titanic. And so who won in your opinion? <laughs> there are only 15 minutes to go until the Titanic hits the iceberg. That's why, you know, and the Titanic is such a perfect analogy. I've used this for years. Because you do have all the elites who are starting to get onto the lifeboats, right? They're starting to, to buy their doomsday retreats in their homesteads. They're all doing it, guys. Patrick uh, Bet David did a short the other day where he was talking about how all of his rich buddies in the, was it centimillionaire and up class at this recent event he went to, they were all talking about prepping. Does it really matter, she says. There are only 15 minutes to go until the Titanic hits the iceberg. And by the way... I'm the violin guys on the Titanic playing the violin. Or maybe I'm the guy screaming, we're all going to die. I don't know. I haven't quite figured it out yet what my role is. I think that my blue strip content is uh, to try to try to soothe people a little bit. And this content is just to remind people of how fucked we actually are. Does it even make a difference? I don't know. Maybe if someone thought that one of them would break into the wheelhouse and spin the helm the other way, find some maps, do something, check the lifeboats, I don't know, maybe some miracle would occur. What does she say? But that's exactly how it was. You see, who sang better, who danced better? That's exactly what it is, it's grandstanding. All these bullshit debates are, who can appear more charismatic? Who looks better under this lighting? Who can speak more eloquently? for two hours. Uh, how many barbs did they get in? It's not about the objective solution focused making solutions. It's, it's just about, you know, who's going to win the match, which is why I don't even pay attention. In fact, the best thing they ever did in those debates was get rid of the audience because the audience is the absolute worst. It just increases the spectacle uh, because if you need an audience there to, to uh, confirm your reaction to, how can I say, there's something called consensus validity, so that if 100 people say, yeah, Kamala won, then you would be more inclined to believe that she won also. Uh, I'm glad that they got rid of that. That's one good thing that they've done. But besides that, it's, yeah, there's an old Muhammad Ali video where he's talking about why he wouldn't want to be the first black president because that would mean that the ship was sinking. Well, let's look at what happened in what happened in 2008. Was it Obama? <laughs> now you got Kamala. So I guess you know what's happening here. He's like, uh, anyways, you go watch the clip. It's a funny clip. He's a very prescient cat, Muhammad Ali. This guy, we don't want to talk about this guy. This is silly. Turkey's nuclear power plant, first nuclear power plant has hit a snag. Because uh, apparently Germany's backed out and uh, the Russians are now 
stuck because there's a bottleneck in the supply chain and they're working with the Germans on building this and so things are falling through and this maybe is why Erdogan is saying that, you know, the Crimea has got to go back to Ukraine, you know. California is burning again. It's been burning up here for a long time. We've just seen some insane temperatures. Fall is finally, finally starting to come. UK already permitted Kiev to use storm shadows, but will not admit it publicly. This is all Russian media. So massive escalation is impending. I think that is all we need to cover. Oh, and Russia is finally going to limit nuclear materials, uranium, titanium, and nickel to the United States. I know that the deal to provide U.S. nuclear power plants with uh, nuclear materials that require a very special kind of enriched uranium that only Russia could provide, that deal is done this year. So I'm not sure if there's more uh, trade that occurs uh, for those precious minerals or not but yeah that's what i got for you today folks let me know what your thoughts were on the debate and if you want to support the channel the best way to do it because you know i don't do commercials at the beginning of the video go and gear up at canadianpreparedness.com we have the widest array of preparedness and survival gear that you're going to find it's all vetted stuff it's all high quality stuff and uh, we have very good prices as well if you want to support a small business support us if you want to support amazon and walmart go for it but to your own peril thanks for watching my friends take care canadian prepper out